Today's video is sponsored by Blackwater. Follow the links in the description to check them out and support my sponsor. Okay, so I think I, uh, I think I may have stumbled into another uh, guitar, a major guitar purchase here. I was scrolling around Craigslist, and uh, I'll show you what I was looking at. Well, f actually, this Fender M80 guitar cab, it says guitar cab, but it's more than just a cab. This is the head, 412 cab and 212 speaker cab. This is the whole thing, and um, the reason I show this is because uh, you guys have asked before about what cabinet I use. I just happened to see this on Craigslist and uh, was checking it out. And I use this exact same cab for most of my demos. All my uh, testing is done on this cab. But this has the whole setup with a with an extension 212 cab, the M80 Pro head, and some Behringer equipment as well. Um, what was he asking? 480 bucks? 450 bucks, I mean. But yeah, that's not what I was going to show you. I was going to show you... Um, on Craigslist what I stumbled across and what I'm probably going to end up buying. I've already contacted the guy about this and we may do an extended video about it but uh, I wanted to show you what I was looking at here. Here we go. A 1956 Martin D21 uh, a Martin D21 is basically, um, but you know, it's between a, a D18 and a D28. A D28 uh, has a few more, um, few more little appointments, some some more uh, purfling and things like that. I think, um, but it has the Brazilian rosewood back and sides uh, when you get back into these uh, in the 1950s. But he said the um, he said this one, I mean, to me though, it does, I don't know, the back and sides, just from what little glimpse I can catch here, it does look like a D18, it doesn't look like a D21, so I'm going to have to definitely check that out, I'll also check, have to check the year, um, with the serial number, um, he's going to message me back the serial number, uh, so I can check, so I can do that, so I can check the year, but, uh, but yeah, he said, um, The pit guard supposedly has has some issues, and I can definitely see that. I'm wondering if there's a pit guard crack here where the pit guard may have shrunk. I don't know, possibly, but um, I know I'm going to have to replace this pit guard. There's something going on with it. It's it's uh, bubbling up or cracking up or something. Uh, he said there's no cracks in the top uh, in the guitar at all, though. I asked him about cracks. He said no cracks. Um, also, uh, no neck issues. He said the um, action was good, so that means it might not have need a neck reset. So, um, you know, which you never really know until you put your hands on one, uh, whether it's being described accurately. But okay, so I thought I would chime in here just a second um, because later on, when I was looking at this thing a little more closely, here is the actual ad that was on Craigslist and. The, you know, the photos are real grainy. You can't really see a whole lot. You can't really tell a whole lot from this picture or the other picture for that matter. And the description is very limited and lacking in detail. So, um, and the guy really didn't seem to know very much when I talked to him. So it was kind of a lost cause to try to talk to the guy over the phone about it or any of that stuff. So this is one of those situations where you really have to put your hands on something and see it in person. Uh, and he kind of lived a bit far away. So, you know, meeting it, meeting up with him was, uh, was going to be somewhat of a challenge, but not undoable. But I did notice a couple of, uh, red flags about this. Um, the more I looked at it, uh, and we'll see if you can't spot some of the same red flags. Um, you know, again, with a Martin guitar, it's kind of limited, especially with grainy pictures. It's kind of limited, but there are a couple things here. Uh, that should uh, throw up red flags. And I think this guitar also threw up red flags to other potential buyers that may have been buyers had they not been thrown off by the red flags. But let's see if you can catch these red flags before uh, I finally reveal them, probably in another video, but we'll, but we'll see how it goes. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, he wants he wants thirty nine hundred for this thing. Um, I've already offered him uh, slightly less, and he he said he would take it. But again, I'm kind of leery of of what it is, what year it is, um, all of these little things. So I, I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to definitely check this out. I mean, it, Martin is very good about their serial numbers. You can date one pretty lickety split with just serial numbers. I, in fact, I've got somewhere I've got a little pocket. Um, I've got a little pocket serial number Martin dater thing. I might I might actually have a copy in here. Um, I wonder if I have a copy in here. They, uh, they used to give them out. I don't know if they still do or not, but they're like uh, business card size things that have the uh, basically a list of all the serial numbers, like the start and stop serial numbers for each uh, year so you can accurately date your Martin. Yeah, right there. I do have one. You might not be able to read this, but... Uh, Basically, it's like a little business card, and it f folds out. Let's see. Yeah, and it's got all of the Martin serial numbers on there, so I'll probably take this with me when I go to date this thing. Uh, but it looks like for 1956, the serial number should be around the 153,000 range. So somewhere between 153 and 159,000. Also, if it does not have Brazilian uh, rosewood back and sides, then you know it's not a D21 because all D21s had Brazilian rosewood back and sides. They discontinued the D21 when they were moving away from Brazilian. So as a consequence, uh, they all will have uh, Brazilian rosewood back and sides on the D21. D28s, of course, you know, they, they spanned before and after the demarcation of around 1969 when they stopped using Brazilian. The thing was, around 1969 is when uh, uh, the U.S. changed its laws on Brazilian rosewood, the importation and uh, exportation of Brazilian rosewood, and you couldn't any longer get um, newly felled Brazilian rosewood uh, imported so uh, people just basically bled off all the remaining stocks and built out whatever guitars um, they had remaining after that so you'll get Brazilian rosewood made guitars after 1969 but they're usually from luthiers who stockpiled Brazilian uh, before the changeover before the new law took effect and you know they're still building with with uh, those materials but pretty much now in 2018 um, you know any new Brazilian is mostly for the most part is gone um, you can still find it a few luthiers probably still have are sitting on some of it um, but it's it's not you know it's not particularly uh, prevalent but anyway yeah this should have Brazilian rosewood back and sides and you can't see anything from these pictures there's only two pictures here so it really isn't, it isn't telling me very much but I'm excited to take a look at it it should be interesting to see and I'll, I'll try to take video when I do look at it and even if I don't end up buying this guitar from this fellow, uh, maybe we'll have uh, some video to show of it. So yeah, let's uh, let's cross our fingers that it's the real deal, and I might uh, might end up with an another nice acoustic. Oh, another thing too, um, you guys are probably wondering what's going on with this new setup. Well, I'm going to probably at some point start doing uh, the occasional. I'm not going to do it a lot, but maybe the occasional live stream over on Channel 2 only. I'm not going to do live streams on Channel 1, I don't think. But um, maybe over on Channel 2, I'll throw an occasional live stream. Because over there is just kind of the dustbin of, of uh, my thoughts anyway, you know. It's kind of like the shittier shit post Friday stuff that I'll put over there, you know. All the little unusual things that I'll fix around the house or what have you will probably go over there too. But uh, I'm... Uh, kind of trying to gear up and learn this program and try to get good at it before I go live on anything because, you know, obviously I don't want to start screwing up in a live situation and then just look like a freaking idiot. So uh, the idea is to try to get um, try to get used to messing with this program beforehand. And I'm also going to upgrade this camera. I know this is extremely grainy on the webcam, so I'm going to upgrade the webcam. Uh, I think. Uh, may have a couple of things coming from Banggood that the guy is going to give me for free so I can maybe do a review. Um, that might even be the first live stream. I'll do like a live stream review of the camera with um, 
and everything with this setup and uh, just kind of kill two birds with one stone and maybe even get a free camera in the process. Thumbs crossed or thumbs crossed. <laughs> So yeah, but that explains uh, this whole setup and, and why I've gone to this. And, uh, you know, for some of you guys who are afraid this might be my permanent uh, video quality, it won't be. So, but you know, while we're looking at it, and we may as well uh, take a look and see what what else is out here on Craigslist. There were a couple of things I ran across. I already had kind of bookmarked here. Um this thing I saw, and it's been up there for so long, and I've been kind of tempted to pick it up just for the hell of it, because I don't know why. I just kind of like this gu guitar. Um, the styling is kind of cool. It's that limited edition uh, VW um, first act guitar that came with uh, Volkswagen uh, cars. You know, I think some of the Volkswagen cars, they had a place where you could plug into the stereo, and it would be a guitar amplifier. it play through the stereo speakers. Um, and they gave away a guitar when you bought the car, and this was the guitar they gave away when you bought the car. See, there's uh, see the little VW with the fingers on the truss rod cover there. Uh, I don't know why. And then they've got special VW um, insignia back here on the on the mounting plate, and then there's a little plate on the back of the headstock as well, and it comes with a little gig bag. But for a hundred bucks, I mean, gosh, I'm just just kind of tempted to pick it up just for the hell of it. Um, also, this is probably something I'm going to end up getting as well. This is a uh, uh, this is an, a late 1950s RCA Victor uh, Victrola. Uh, tube radio and record player now i've got one that's very similar to this and i've also featured one on the channel that i redid for a young lady uh, that was almost identical to this but this one's even better because it has the radio installed hers didn't even didn't have the radio so here's the radio over on this side hers just had a spot for records over here and i mean for 75 bucks uh i if i remember correctly this thing had you know, if nothing else, the the parts. I mean, you've got two 12-inch speakers. You've got a chassis. You've got uh, two 6V6s. You've got some preamp tubes. Um, you know, a 5Y3. You've got two output transformers, a power transformer. You've got a lot of stuff here that if you wanted to uh, make something out of, <coughs> out of this, that even if you didn't uh, want to use it as a record player or whatever, you know, if you even if you parted it out is what I'm saying. I'm not advocating parting something like this out, but even if you did part it out, you would be way ahead of seventy five dollars. Um, you know, I mean, I think it would be a travesty to to part something like this out. But yeah, you know, for seventy five bucks, the only problem is it's way on the other side of town, and um, I don't know if I want to drive all the way over there to pick it up. And plus, I, I. I'm not 100% sure it's going to fit in the back seat of my Jaguar. A lot of stuff, surprisingly, will fit in the back seat of that thing, and I've gotten stuff home in it before that I really probably shouldn't have been able to get home in it. Um, but still, um, I'm, I'm just unsure, so it would kind of suck if I drove all the way over there and couldn't load it. But I, I'm probably going to end up with that thing at some point. We may make a uh, video of it. I bookmarked this Chroma Harp 21 chord um, auto harp because these things are cool. I, I try to keep one around just because I like the sound of an auto harp. And if I ever did a uh, recording, any re you know, recording again, seriously, like I used to way back in the, you know, probably 10 or 12 years ago, I did a lot of recording. And I tried to keep odd instruments around because you never know what kind of thing you might be going for in a certain track or something. And, um, it was always cool to have one of these around because uh, you could get just little special effects and things. And plus, writing with one of these, uh, the 21 chord is actually more chords than you'll, uh, the, the standard 15 chord, um, which like the Oscar Schmidt uh, are usually standard 15 chord auto harps. And this is a better, uh, this is really the best, the one you want is the 21 chord. But, um, they're just cool instruments to have around, man. And if you keep them in tune and you keep them uh, with good strings and stuff on them, they can sound really fantastic. And if you're into folky music or mountain music or whatever, um, they can really add kind of a uh, an eerie creepiness to the to the 
uh, overall ambiance of your track too. And then this one, man, this is super cool. This is a 1957 Carvin uh, Tweed Twin 1212A amplifier. And man, I've gone back and forth in my head on this one. As you can probably imagine, where is the? Oh, this is down in Nashville. I think that's one of the reasons uh, I haven't gotten it. It's just too far away. And plus, uh, 750 is probably is probably you know full dollar amount. I I usually don't pay full retail for something because I need to leave some room to be able to service it and then still turn around and sell it at some kind of a profit, even if it's a minimal profit. And one of the, you know that's one of the reasons I started this channel was because. Um, I wanted to be able to, uh, you know, on, on some of the things that I wanted to buy desperately and I wanted to save, you know, and I wanted to uh, show, I wanted to show them off first of all, but I also wanted to uh, try to generate a little bit of revenue in between there because I'm servicing it anyway and I'm trying to make as, um, as much as I can on the thing, but a lot of times margins are very slim, you know, I, I'll have to pay um, almost retail for something and I and by the time I finish everything I might only make you know 75 bucks maybe or, or 100 bucks on, on a piece so if I'm flipping something like that anyway I would like to maximize my profits and that's kind of what this channel was about in the beginning I was trying to um, well first of all show it off and have a way to to sell the things on but then when I started doing repair videos that's also became a way for me to kill two birds with one stone I could fix the things and also, um, you know, make a little money, make, perhaps on YouTube, also by monetizing. So, um, so it's it's worked out okay, I'd say, you know, so far. Um, kind of an odd business plan, not one I, uh, not one I really set out to do, but it's uh, worked out so far. Nice uh, triad output transformer on it. It looks like it's got the original speakers, but we're missing the bell on one of them. But yeah, these Jensen's, man, that this thing will probably sound phenomenal. Yeah, anything from around this era uh, just seems to be, seems to always sound great. Um, something's happened though to all the writing. I, I don't, I don't think it would have been like this. I'm sure it's just all been rubbed off. But, um, or maybe this is some kind of prototype. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not up and up on Carvin. The you know I do know Carvin's been around for a long time. They've been around since the '40s, and they uh, put out you know they started out doing amplifiers and uh, Hawaiian lap steel guitars and stuff like that too. Um, when that craze was still going on, but just a really cool piece. Then I saw this. This is a Mesa Boogie Mark IV uh, for 850 bucks. I mean that's a fraction of what you would have paid for for the thing new. And that's the combo version, too. Um, probably with the 112. Uh, and he says here it's been recently serviced by Boogie, so it should have a full uh, full clean bill of health, I would, I would guess. It's got the foot switch. But yeah, man, for 850 bucks, you know, if you were in the market for a Mesa Boogie, that would be a, a good one to buy. And then I saw this, too. Uh, I featured a Softec... Um, uh, MIG, what was it, a MIG-50 though I thought I had, I think it was a MIG-50 and then later they came out with like the mid MIG-60 and uh, uh, and this is the later version I do believe but yeah this would be a great amplifier if you were looking for something that would be you know like a, a Marshall Killer um, this would this would do it so yeah, that's some of the other stuff I've I've looked at and I've seen recently on Craigslist. I just kind of I star these things when I go through. <laughs> Way too many guitars in the house. That one looks like some kind of uh That looks like some kind of custom thing, I would guess. Uh Oh yeah, it is a custom thing. RWG. That is a local builder, I do believe. Uh, Raven West. No, it's not. Pardon me. No, the RWGs. Those are something else. Um, they are Chinese made, I think, and they're uh, they actually look really nice. I've never put my hands on one, um, but every time I've kind of been tempted a couple times because they're usually 
they were even new, they're really cheap, and the appointments are just kind of over the top. I mean, you get like really nice tops and everything on these. Um, it's been a while since I've seen one, but and then you get like the you know the inlay, and that's I think that's real abalone inlay. That's not I mean they didn't skimp on that. And it just always seemed like they were really well made. Like, see, this one's uh, this one's neck through body. It's got flame maple on the back. It looks like it's got uh, uh, it's, it's got probably maple and walnut, maple, walnut, maple, uh, neck through body. So that would be a nice guitar. I mean, especially for the money. Uh, what's this thing? Ah, anyway, you get the idea. You'll see all kinds of stuff like that. Lots of deals to be had on Craigslist. There's a snake bite. These trans tubes, man, um, you know, you can usually pick these up for a song as well. Now, I know that they're, <clears throat> I know they're solid state, and a lot of us, uh, we look down our noses at solid state a lot. Sometimes unduly, uh, we look down our noses at solid state. and the, But these PV trans tubes, they uh they had a pretty decent sound um you know for what they are you could I got a friend who recorded a lot of uh, uh 80s type music and stuff and he he swore by his he had a little combo and he played in a an apartment and stuff too and he had a little combo and he would stick it in his closet and surround it by with clothes and or whatever and stick his uh microphone in there and just kind of you know make himself a little makeshift isolation box and uh and just rock the hell out and record with them. Uh, but the speakers that are in those two, these, um, I think they have the Sheffield speakers in them. Those cabinets are really underrated. Those are those are nice cabs. They sound great. Everyone I've ever plugged into sounded great. PV is underrated stuff. I mean, overall. <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly what year they started producing stuff overseas, but up to a certain point, everything PV made was made in the U.S. And it hasn't been all that long ago. Because there was a, uh, what was it? It was the uh, uh, Undercover Boss or whatever episode where, um, you know, they uh, they sent the other Undercover Boss in and he discovered, like, all the, all the complaints that the you know, the factory people were having and all this, and they went and rewarded a bunch of factory people and, like, patted them on the back, said, good job, and then, like, it was it was within... I think it was even before that episode aired. They, they had already announced they were going to move overseas and close down that factory. It was just really... Just a PR nightmare. Why in the hell did they do that? They would have been better off just quietly closing down the factory instead of doing the whole, you know... Uh, the whole bait and switch. <laughs> it was just a nightmare. There's an Ibanez Jim. I'm uh, it was a Jim Junior. Nice Weber speaker <clears throat> for fifty bucks. That'd be cheaper than new. The thing about speakers too, man, is okay. Date night, uh, uh, 2013. So that's five year old speaker. Maybe it has five years uh, worth of uh, being broken in on it. Because, I mean, the thing about speakers is, man, after they've been broken in, as long as it's not blown, as long if it's just been broken in, it'll be better than new. And these intrigued me. This, the first time I saw one of these uh, was on Craigslist. This is a Lace Helix. A lace helix base. Look at the knobs on them. It's it's got like uh, you know you stick your finger in there and and you can you know turn them up like that or down. Really cool. Nice hardware. Looks beautiful. It looks really really well made. Five strings, and for the for three hundred fifty bucks. I mean, that's crazy. For what it is. That's a nice looking base. Six piece laminated neck. 
Yeah, it looks like more than that to me. No, okay. It's got some couple wings there. Never mind. I was going to say it looks like eight piece, but it's not. But yeah, good looking base for the money, and you just you can't. It, it's it, it's really hard to compete, man. Uh, you know, if you try to build a base like that from uh, from scratch uh, as a boutique builder or something, uh, you you know you'd be you'd be hard you'd be hard really hard pressed to develop the skills to match that kind of quality and come anywhere close to three hundred fifty bucks. Soundcraft boards, are, those are kind of nice. They're asking too much, a little too much money, I think, for that, though. Oh, there's one like mine. Pre-lawsuit. I guess that makes it like twice as expensive, doesn't it? <laughs> it's very similar to the one I've got, except mine has the three-way switch. This one has the, uh, the rotary switch. Nice guitar. That's that's way high side though for a CE24. You know, I was uh I was sitting here the other day. I had a visit from the guys at Mother Plucker. They brought over um, uh, Doug and Keith. They brought over another one of their builds for me to take a look at because they we've been talking about different builds and everything. And uh, they just came over for a visit and brought one of their new builds for me to check out. And we sat around and talked for a long time and. Uh, we got out a couple of my PRSs as well, and we're just kind of talking about those. And I was just noticing how huge, you know, I knew that I knew this already. I knew how huge the neck heels are on some of their models, like some of their later ones. You know, really long neck heels, and they kind of start at about the fifteenth fret and run all the way up. Uh, really thick neck heels, and then some of their earlier ones, like the CE uh, twenty four that I have. Uh, it has a way shorter neck heel that doesn't start until like the 19th fret or something, like way on up there. Uh, so it's like you get a lot more reach out of the thing. Um, and I think they changed it because they said for stability purposes, but I much prefer that smaller neck heel. Um, and that's one of the reasons I uh, I prefer that uh, CE24 to the, you know, to the nicer um Whatever it is, I think it's what is it? A custom twenty four? I think is the other one I have. Vintage Marshall Head Collection. Look at that! That's impressive. What an impressive stack of heads that is. Oh, there it is, right there. That's the one. That's the one. That's the JMP twenty two oh four right there. That is the one you want, folks. Yep, 1978 JMP 2204. And then you've got a 1980 uh, JCM 800 2204. And those will kick your face in, too. And you got an 86 as well. And he's got a 2205 also. Uh, that'll be the one, I think, with channel switching. 2205, if I recall correctly. Or it's the, uh, does it, or does it have reverb? I can't remember which. It might have a channel switch with two master volumes. I think it does. Um, I'd have to look at it again. Really nice. Value each head at a fair uh, market pricing per reverb, guitar center, yada yada. And if you're getting it on Craigslist locally, sometimes you can talk a guy down because he knows if he has to put it on uh, reverb, he's going to be paying, um, you know, he's going to be paying reverb fee, and he's going to turn around and have to pay the uh, PayPal fee also. So, um, and the, and sh there's going to be shipping factored in too. So, uh, you know, when the the buyer is going to have to pay for that, but he factors it in to how much he's going to pay overall. So you really you're losing the shipping as well, really in reality. Um, so yeah, if, uh, on local sales, man, sometimes you can get some deals on stuff like that if you're not buying, you know, having to ship it. There's a 5150 half stack for 1300 bucks, probably a little bit that's high. 
But yeah, this is kind of the stuff that I do um, when I'm just bored. Uh, there's a wampler. <laughs> if anybody wants a wampler. I think he, I think he may pronounce his name Wampler also. I don't know. I'm terrible at pronunciations. You guys know that. Uh, here's a rogue sitar. I mean, it, that'll be a lot cheaper than one of the original, like, uh, Dan Electro sitars or the Coral, you know. The Vincent Bell designed uh, actual ones. Th this one's cool because it has, like, a 1980s Charvel crackle finish. <laughs> That's very interesting. That would be a cool instrument to have, too. Like, if you had a, um, you know, if you have a studio and you just want... You want different sounds for, you know, tracks and stuff. Just to have that sitting around, like, so you could grab it. Um, if you decided a track just needed some kind of spice or something. And also, an instrument like that, you can kind of sit around and oftentimes come up with something you never would have come up with. Or you write something, you know, you never would have written on just a, a regular guitar. You know what? I almost passed by... Uh, I almost just went right over this seagull. These these seagulls, man, those are uh, for the money. And that, oh, that's a twelve string for two hundred bucks. All that'll be all solid wood, uh, North American made, um, well made. Also, I can vouch for that. Usually, seagulls are well made, and when and when they've been beaten up and played a long time and stuff, they just tend, they tend to get better and better. Um, so that right there would probably be a nice little guitar for somebody. Nice little player guitar. Just to beat around, 12-string, take to the park, take to the campfire kind of uh, kind of guitar. Other cool thing about those seagulls is that they have bolt-on necks. Uh, so you can actually remove the neck very easily. Uh, so if you need to, you know, if the neck ever needs to be reset or if ever needs to be adjusted or anything it's very easy to do because it's just it's it's bolt on you just take off a little sticker up inside and there i think if i'm if i'm recalling correctly there's two bolts that just bolt the necks on and for 200 bucks geez man that's uh you're not going to get a 12 string better than that anywhere for that kind of money you know that you're just you're just not if you need a 12 string, that would be the one to buy. That's cheap for that MIDI. Uh, I bet that pedal board, that right there, that MIDI switch for that art. I bet when that was new, that was probably a $200 foot pedal, at least. Yeah, I've seen this one too. This is a 1966 Supro Thunderbolt. And, you know, I've got a special, very special place in my heart for Supro Thunderbolts. Um, but this one's, that's all the money. Really, 1100 And I think this one is a solid-state rectifier version. They made two different versions. Uh, they made one with a uh, solid-state rectifier and one with the um, tube rectifier. He's not showing... Yeah, he is. Here we go. Uh, no, that one's tube. That's tube rectifier. Uh, the thing is, though, the problem with this one... Let's see. Yeah, you see right there? You see the color of that uh, that grill cloth? So you've got like a really light, and then you have a stripe of black, and a really light, and a stripe of black. That is what the grill cloth is supposed to look like. And, oh, it does. Oh, for some reason I was thinking somebody spray painted it. So that mm, it's po uh, that's original. It's missing the logo, though. It does look like somebody spray painted the cabinet. Uh, Cause that should have been blue. I don't think they made these in black. I think the cabinet's been spray painted. Um, 38th week of 65. 41st week of 65. He's saying it's a 66, but looks like 60, solid 65 to me. But anyway. Uh, yeah, it's a 65. But yeah, in 1965, uh, that should have been blue on the cabinet, and so somebody's probably spray-painted it. He doesn't say anything about that, though. That's the thing. In the 
I don't know what it is about the 1970s, but um, kids who started playing in the 1970s, it seemed like, you know, all the cool uh, Tweed 50s stuff and, um, you know, the 60s stuff that was different uh, coverings, you know, they wanted to spray paint everything black because, you know, that's their heroes all had black uh, behind them, you know, marshals and, and stuff like that. And, and the black face fenders, you know, they're all covered in black. So the, the higher end um, stuff of the time of like the 70s and 80s was black so everything got not everything but a lot of stuff got spray painted in those two decades by uh misguided kids <laughs> trying to trying to blend in a lot of nice mics there's some dude who's selling some really nice uh telefunken mics and uh he's got some nice stuff Uh, this 1978 list, he's uh, this is too much money for it. Uh, five grand is is that's too much for it. But these are awesome guitars, and it's a shame about the photos. But this is the 2550 anniversary Les Paul. There we go. It's a little bit better. Uh, so it's got a you know it's got a specialty uh, headstock inlay. It's got um, uh, some specialty inlays on the fretboard. You can see there just killer uh, and they've also got fine tuners uh, on the bridges on those just cool cool Les Pauls they came out with a couple different really nice Les Pauls in the late 70s that are you know different from anything else you can get There's an American Strat with what some DiMarzio uh, rails in there. I bet it'll sound fantastic. No money to be made though. Seven fifty. That's about right on for at least for my area. That's about what you can sell a, a USA standard Strat for. Usually, and you never get the money back for the upgraded pickups. That's the thing. You like the you know. Um, whoever spent the money on the pickups, you just you'll never get that back out of it. Yeah, he's he's got some Newman uh, microphones. I think this is the same guy. It's like liquidating a studio or something. He's got some nice mics. I don't know why they're saying that's a rare pedal, a full a full tone full drive too. That's not a rare pedal. I mean, it's just a it's a pedal. This this guy's out of his mind. I mean, I like I like uh, vintage straps, but I mean, geez, <laughs> this isn't even a real good one. This is not like a uh, a '60s Ace or anything. This is a you know, it's a decent strap, but I mean, I, I say decent in terms of you know, it's got a cool pattern and everything, and it's labeled Gibson. But for ninety nine bucks, yeah, dude, you're you're dreaming. I believe on that. I'm I'm afraid to say. I think you are. I've got one of these task scams. I had one uh, uh, when I first started doing recordings and stuff. I had a an eight track version, like the biggest one they made, the biggest cassette uh, Porta Studio that they made. It was the four twenty eight or whatever, um, or eight nine twenty eight or something like. That. I don't remember. But anyway, um, I had the biggest one they could make. Right now, I've got a four track though somewhere. Right now, it's in, still in the box and stuff. Uh, I think it's kind of stored, put up somewhere. I should drag that out sometime and see if it even works. Uh, Les Paul Classic for fourteen hundred bucks. It's black. It's got the case. Yeah, I'd say all you know all day long thirteen fourteen hundred bucks for a Les Paul Classic. It's a good buy, and this is part of the problem. You know, Gibson's probably going to have going forward if they're if they're making any of the lines that they're making that are player guitars grade, uh, they're going to be competing with the stuff that's already on the market. And this and from what I can tell, uh, Les Paul standards, Les Paul classics, Les Paul traditionals, um, you know, from the '90s into the 2000s, 
those are, you know, they're in the thirteen to sixteen hundred dollar range pretty consistently, and um, it's just, you know, that's a big discount over a new one. There's a studio for nine hundred bucks, wine red. There's one of those teleacoustics. <laughs> those are interesting. Somebody was telling me the other day they dug one out of the uh, trash. They dug a strat acoustic. Out of the trash. They found it in a dumpster. I don't know who that was. They messaged me and said, Hey, I found my first guitar, my first dumpster guitar, and it was a Strat Acoustic. Uh I had one of those class five amplifiers. I think I had a I think I had a combo version of that Marshall Class Five at um and I flipped it at some point. Or got it on a trade or something and basically had zero dollars in it. And ended up flipping it, but um, I wasn't, I was kind of eh about it. I wasn't too impressed, but I wasn't unimpressed necessarily. I mean, I guess it did what it said it set out to do. A Bedell with Brazilian Rosewood. 3500 bucks. Let's see, I could either have, I could either have a $3,500 Bedell. Or I could spend thirty nine hundred and have a nineteen fifties Martin hmm. with Brazilian rosewood. <laughs> decisions, decisions. That would be like an early seventies. Uh, let's see, cameo. So that'll be a Japanese Fender copy. Japan didn't start really making copies until about 1970 or 71, it seems. And then from about 70 or 71 through the mid-70s, it was just all Japanese copies, uh, uh, Fender and Gibson copies. Um, and they almost made nothing. Or they did make other things, but that's about all you would see in the catalogs anymore at a certain point. More microphones. Nice Dobro. Another Les Paul. There's what I need. I need a I need a, a portable dance floor. So basically, I can uh, when I get to my destination, I can set it up and and do my dance. <laughs> I'm already being followed around by my uh, by my theme music. Every good hero. Should have some. It's my theme music. <laughs> this thing intrigued me. I saw this uh, the other day too, when I was scrolling through Craigslist here. Yeah, this is a cop. This is a copy of a Strandberg. I've never even heard of a Strandberg. What the hell's a Strand? Did he mean to say a Steinberg? Probably. But I haven't even seen a Steinberger with that that kind of shape I, that I recall. That's an interesting shape. It's just like really blobby. But headless. Um, interesting. He says the pickups are why it's priced so high. I guess he upgraded the pickups. This is probably one of those you can get like on uh, Alibaba or something, you know. I'm just I'm just not familiar with that one. A little solid state Rickenbacker, probably from the 70s. There's another one, a TR25. I wonder if that one's tube. That's got to be solid state. Well, let's see. I should be able to tell the year off that imminent speaker right there. Uh, let's see. Eminence, 1979. 22nd week of 79. That's a nice speaker, too. Even for just the speaker, that would be cool. 125 bucks or best offer. This is the kind of thing I sort of gravitate toward because it's just unusual. Uh, you can't walk into any, just any guitar center and see it. So, uh, you know, it's usually deserving of a click if I see one on something like this on Craigslist. I've had one of these Schecter Hellcats uh, before as well. I just like the styling of it. It's got kind of that offset 
uh, Fender sort of styling, but it's the pickups and everything look like something that would have come out of 60s Japan. Just an interesting looking uh, configuration with the three switches and everything. It just really looks like a old school sort of Japanese. But then you got the block inlays, which kind of give it away, and that headstock is... Uh, to me, the headstock really doesn't fit the style. Um, I, I, I thought they could have done something different with the headstock. Maybe made a o real oversized scroll or something. Would have been cooler. But but yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Um, when we're looking through Craigslist, just checking things out. $200 for a Fender Baseman 215 cab. Uh, Squire Classic Vibe Telecaster. Those are great player guitars. Lots of stuff to be had. But yeah, um, anyway, there's that. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit subscribe down below. And for now, y'all take care.